So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Timothy Ruback. I teach here at the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center at Dartmouth College. We're all very glad we could, that you could join us today. I'd like to take a moment before we begin to ask everyone to turn their cell phones off if you haven't done so already. And uh, having done that, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's public lecture, Why Civil Resistance Works, Nonviolence in the Past and Future by Erica Chenoweth. Erica is currently a professor in the government department at Wesleyan College. She's been a scholar at Berkeley's Institute for International Studies, Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation, and Harvard's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Her work on civil resistance reminds us that organized nonviolence can be an especially effective strategy in achieving political goals. This is true even when faced with serious repression. This work on nonviolence as a strategy is garnering attention and international acclaim, and not just from academics. Her most recent co-authored book, Why Civil Resistance Works, the Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, has been recognized as a 2011 Book of the Year by The Guardian. It has been nominated for the 2012 Lionel Gelber Prize, which is a literary award for the best nonfiction book in English on foreign affairs that can deepen public debate on significant international issues. And proving that academics are in on the act as well, it has been nominated for the American Political Science Awards Association's um, Robert Jervis and Paul Schroeder Award for the best book in international history and politics. This is nothing new. Her last book, a volume on states and non-state actors in international conflict, was also nominated for the Jervis and Schroeder Award just one year previously. Her work on nonviolence serves as an effective counterpoint to her research on global terrorism. At Wesleyan, Erica also directs the program on terrorism and insurgency research. She has published extensively on motivations for terrorism, <coughs> on what might make an individual or group choose terrorism rather than civil resistance or some other tactic in order to achieve political ends. She's also written extensively on the relationship between terrorism and democracy. She also soon will be publishing a textbook on understanding terrorism, one that I think will offer a historical and analytic approach from a multiple th set of theoretical perspectives um, in a way that no other textbook successfully does so far. Today, um, I think to speak about nonviolence when one is spending so much energy on the problem of terrorism is to really effectively, I think, stave off despair. It's to remember that political strategies can change, and it's to realize that strategies other than violence are capable of carrying the day. In addition to this lecture on nonviolence, Erica Chenoweth has visited students in a government class taught by Professor Coggins. She has met with many faculty from the Dickey Center's International Relations and Foreign Policy Working Group, and she will be meeting with members of many student organizations, including Rockefeller Center co-curricular groups later this evening. We're all so happy that Erica has been able to share her time, her enthusiasm, and her ideas with us today. Today she'll be speaking about the potential of nonviolence as a strategy to achieve political goals. She'll be sharing observations on how nonviolence can be an effective strategy, even in difficult times. She will reflect upon past examples and offer considerations on the future. She will speak for about an hour, and then we will open the floor up for questions. So please, I would like now for you to all join me in welcoming Erica Chernoweth. Thank you so much for that generous and warm introduction. And thanks to all of you for coming out on Friday afternoon in the middle of winter. I know that uh, for many of you, you'd probably rather be hunkered down and, and warmed up by now. I just wanted to, to start off by 
saying that Joanne, uh, who I want to thank for her orchestrating of this whole thing, uh, gave me a, a cup of tea before uh, the talk started. And she randomly pulled a, a I guess this is lemon ginger tea bag that uh, has a, a saying on it that essentially sums up my whole presentation. And then I'll sit down and we can have Q&A, um, <laughs> which is uh, your choices will change the world. Uh, so that's much more for you guys than for me, I think, uh, as sort of the thrust of the talk I'm going to talk about today. I just want to say, too, how honored I am that, um, that people saw fit to choose me as, as a, a speaker, as part of this Martin Luther King month uh, celebration. I guess it's happening here at Dartmouth. And I think it's very cool uh, to, to have my work associated with uh, the work of Dr. King and, and so many other people that um, uh, put their lives on the line for many of us to feel freer. So um, let me just get started with, with the research here that I'm going to talk about today. Um, before I uh, tell you the findings, I want to tell you the motivation for the study in the first place. Uh, I am, as Timothy uh, mentioned, kind of a, uh, a convert in some ways. I, I started out my career thinking I was just going to be a terrorism expert uh, or like a guns and bombs mainstream security studies scholar, somebody that studies violence, uh, things that explode, uh, bullets flying through the air. That's sort of my bag. And uh, what happened is that uh, the last year of my graduate training at the University of Colorado, I got an email invitation to apply for a workshop that was called People, Power, and Pedagogy. And this was being hosted by the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict at Colorado College. So uh, the, my, my, my colleague sent me this email and said, here's the other side of the coin. Might be interesting. That's all he said. And the, the part of it that interests me the most was the part where I scrolled down and it said free. And, uh, and that you get a box of books and, and a nice uh, you know, vacation in, in southern Colorado. And so I applied and got in. And then they sent me the box of books. And it was full of, of material uh, by people like Gene Sharp and Kurt Schock and Peter Ackerman and Jack Duvall. A couple DVDs, one called A Force More Powerful, which is a very uh, effective uh, documentary series about the power of nonviolence. And I'm reading this stuff. And I was kind of shocked because the, the thrust of the, many of the arguments that was in common across these readings was that nonviolent resistance, civil resistance, can be an effective force for change in the world, even more effective than violent resistance in many contexts. Now, I must say that this was a completely new argument to me. Coming from my background, when I saw the word nonviolent or nonviolence, I immediately conflated it with pacifism. So anytime somebody used the word nonviolent or nonviolence, I would put them in a category of people that I thought were committed to the use or deployment of nonviolence for moral or principled reasons. And uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, but it wasn't a topic of interest for me. And so this set of arguments was saying that there are pragmatic reasons uh, leaving aside the moral or principled reasons for using nonviolent resistance to where it's a more strategically effective choice in achieving political aims. And so it was appealing more to the, the part of me that, that resonated with rational choice models and, and things like that were very familiar in my field. But here's the, here's the weird thing. There was no cross-referencing at all. None of the stuff that I had ever studied on violent conflict ever referenced this stuff on nonviolent resistance. And none of the stuff on nonviolent resistance was referencing any of the stuff on violence. Um, yet they were talking about many of the same dynamics. So needless to say, this piqued my curiosity. I go to this conference, and I sit in the back of the room and become very quickly the least popular person at the conference, <laughs> right? Because I kept challenging. You know, they were bringing up very compelling cases. They're in Serbia, you know, the, the Serbs brought down Milosevic, the butcher of the Balkans, you know, using nonviolent, strategic nonviolent action. And, and I said, okay, well, is this unique or is it a pattern? We don't know. And, and so sort of toward the end of the week, um, I talked to a lot of different people. And uh, basically, they, they asked me to um, you know, think about, if you wanted to do a research design where you would actually study whether nonviolent resistance is more effective than violent resistance, how would you do it? And so I kind of set it up in the most skeptical way possible. And I'll tell you how I did that. Um, and that sort of is, is what leads to where we are today. So let me tell you why I had some reservations about the effectiveness of nonviolent resistance. So nonviolent resistance, as I'm talking about it, I'll use the terms nonviolent resistance and civil resistance interchangeably. 
So this is a, a very particular category of phenomenon. What I'm talking about when I say nonviolent or civil resistance is a form of active conflict where unarmed civilians use a variety of nonviolent tactics like strikes, boycotts, protests, stay aways, demonstrations, and other things to try to affect political change without using violence or threatening to use physical violence against the opponent. A nonviolent resistance campaign is a series of these tactics that are linked together and coordinated, usually by an organized group, uh, to some particular end. So, you know, the Serbs in, in, uh, uh, in the Oatpour movement were, de were prosecuting a nonviolent direct action campaign, a civil resistance campaign. Uh, they weren't just having a one off protest every once in a while saying, bring down Milosevic. They had a series of linked and sequenced tactics that were more like a war um, with a variety of battles along the way. So, this is the phenomenon that, that uh, I was most interested in. And the reason that I thought that it was probably not going to be very effective was because of the intellectual environment uh, of, the, of the time. So here were the works that were really dominating the mid-2000s when, when I first became interested in this topic. The first uh, set of arguments was basically saying that violent insurgency is a very effective asymmetric, asymmetric strategy. Um, as long as you adopt an indirect approach, you don't confront a regime you know, directly out in the open battlefield and you do guerrilla tactics and that sort of thing, it can be pretty effective or at least extremely antagonistic to, to major powers. And uh, some people were even taking a further leap and saying, actually, the more violent and nasty you can be, the better. Robert Pape wrote an article, a very provocative one, called The Strategic Logic of Suicide Terrorism. And then he wrote a book called Dying to Kill. Great title, right? And the idea was... Uh, basically, or sorry, Dying to Win. Mia Bloom's uh, book is called Dying to Kill. Bob Pape's book is called Dying to Win. The, the thesis behind his book is that uh, basically suicide terrorism is very effective. So the bloodier and more brutal you can be, especially if it's against a democratic opponent who's occupying military, uh, 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 who's a military occupation, the easier it's going to be to coerce them. So this was the argument. Violence works, and it works better as it gets more violent, right? So Max Abrams, who happened to, to be a, uh, a Dickey Center fellow, I think, um, in the last few years, wrote a, a pretty good article called Why Terrorism Does Not Work in 2006. And he was directly taking on this notion that, especially Pape's argument about suicide terrorism. And, and what he was saying is that basically terrorism is a really horrible communication strategy because people get really distracted by the fact that things are exploding. They, they, they forget what you're saying you want, and they just, they're diverted by the explosion. So it's really hard to stay on message and to make sure that the message doesn't get distorted. So he wrote that article. But on the last page, he says, if that's true, if terrorism doesn't work, why does it happen so often? And he says, probably because it's still more effective than nonviolence. So even if it doesn't work, in his case, he says it only works 7% of the time. He's saying that probably nonviolent resistance works even less often than that, right? So, so that's the, the sort of mainstream view at that point. And then there are some other kind of reasons I had some major resistance to the notion that nonviolent resistance could work. And it emerges from just the idea that there might be certain contexts where it's impossible or that, that violence is truly necessary to achieve major goals. And these major goals would be things like regime change, throwing out a foreign occupying army, or seceding territory. I mean, these are tough things uh, to achieve. Um, we're not talking about you want a wage increase or something like that here. We're talking about uh, the complete reordering of a system. So um, these lead to basically a, a few empirical questions um, that emerged out of you know, the process of seeing this literature and then seeing all of these weird cases from the nonviolent resistance stuff that seem to deviate from our expectations. So these are the questions that I'm going to try to, to uh, provide a nominal answer to today. The first one is, which of them actually does has a, have a more effective track record when you line them up side by side? Nonviolent resistance or violent insurgency? The second question, of course, is we know that nonviolent resistance doesn't always succeed. So when does it fail and why? And uh, the third question is, if we line them up side by side, which of these methods of conflict end up producing 
societies that we'd all kind of want to live in? <laughs> um, and are there real consequences? I mean, when violent insurgency works, is it worth it in the long run? What do we gain from using this as a method of, of conflict if it's unnecessary? So let me first tell you about the way I set up this study, because it's a little important just so that everybody's on the same page about the limits of the research itself. So what I did to, to what I told you about the napkin that I wrote the research design down on, right? Uh, so, so basically the, the napkin turned into a whole long research proposal, which you know, you'd hope it would. <laughs> and it wasn't just a haphazard thing. But what I decided to do is start with a widely accepted data set on internal armed conflict called the correlates of war data, and it's the intrastate um, violence data. <clears throat> and what this is looking at are cases of armed conflict where um, states, organized states, are being challenged by an internal actor um, using armed conflict. And there are at least a thousand battle deaths that have been sustained, and there have been at least a hundred deaths on either side, violent deaths on either side from combat. And so what that means is we're really we're looking at civil wars, basically. And then there's also another, another uh, data set called the extra state wars, and this is dealing with things like military occupations. So what I did was I just set aside all of the correlates of war data, at least 1,000 battle deaths, um, and I, I set aside the ones that had those maximal goals I'm talking about, regime change, anti-occupation, and secession. And the reason I did that is because, as I told you, I was a skeptic. I wanted to pick the hardest cases I could find for where nonviolent resistance could work to compare against. So after I uh, looked at the, the correlates of war data and set aside those cases, then I went and looked for the correlates of nonviolent conflict data set. Believe it or not, there was no such thing. <laughs> and so I had to build it from scratch, and it took two years to do that. And what I was trying to do is find the types of nonviolent civil resistance campaigns that would be as closely analogous to those civil conflicts from the correlates of war data. So anything that didn't reach a minimum participation of 1,000 active observed participants is out. So I only included nonviolent campaigns where there were at least 1,000 people actively participating. So that automatically excludes a huge set of cases. Then what I wanted to look at is whether they were looking ex ex um, explicitly for a change in regime to overthrow the incumbent government, um, to expel a foreign occupying army, or to secede, to secede territory. So I took those hardest demands. So if they're looking at gender rights, wage rights, labor rights, things like that, they're out. Only these three core demands. And then I looked at whether they had a series of observed tactics that are linked and coordinated. So a one-off protest where there are 400,000 people doesn't count. There actually have to be multiple observed tactics in order over in a, in a relatively short period of time. And I can talk a little bit more about the coding rules um, if you'd like to in the Q&A. Um, another thing that I want to mention is that the primary method of conflict is nonviolent. So there might be some cases occasionally where you see a set of demonstration strikes, boycotts, and things like that that go on for six months with thousands of people participating, and then uh, there's a group that blows a few things up. Um, if it doesn't become the primary mode of, of conflict prosecution, I still count that as a nonviolent campaign. But I will designate in the data set that it developed an armed wing. Okay? So we have ideal types of violent campaigns and nonviolent campaigns. Ideal types are always hairy, but the good news is that we actually do observe a number of ideal types. We observe a number of, of campaigns where they're primarily focusing on violence as their strategy and a number of campaigns where they're almost exclusively and in some cases absolutely exclusively relying on nonviolence. So once I kind of went through that whole process, I then uh, did a validation strategy where I circulated the 320 some cases among dozens of experts in the field. And I asked them to evaluate the effectiveness of these campaigns and their view. And what I asked them to look for is, did it achieve what it said it wanted? Did it get rid of the incumbent regime, secede territory, or um, drive out a foreign occupying army? And so uh, I got a bunch of responses back, and then I made some judgments about whether these campaigns succeeded or failed. And I applied very high criteria to the, the um, the, the, the ability of them to succeed. So 
strict coding all around. And then I ran the numbers. And what I found was totally shocking because it was contrary to uh, my expectations and that of the literature um, that nonviolent campaigns actually are more than twice as successful from 1900 to 2006 as violent insurgencies. Um, they're also more than twice as likely to achieve partial success, which is, in my view, it's significant concessions. For instance, they forced a dictator to hold real, true, competitive elections and then elected a new person, but didn't actually force him out of office. That would be a partial success category. Um, and uh, violent campaigns are more than twice as likely to fail. Another thing that really struck me is that actually these trends are overwhelmingly increasing over time. So violent insurgency is becoming an increasingly ineffective method of conflict, whereas nonviolent resistance is becoming increasingly effective over time. So the question is, why is that the case? And in order to answer that, I had to drill down into these cases and find out more attributes of them to see if there are things systematically distinguishing nonviolent campaigns from violent ones. <clears throat> the argument, after looking at a lot of these cases, is that nonviolent campaigns are generally far better at attracting diverse and large participation that's sustainable over time relative to armed campaigns and that the source of success for most non-state actors is people power, basically. And nonviolent campaigns are much better at generating and sustaining people power and of accessing points of leverage within the society based on the composition of their membership. So um, the strategy of civil resistance, uh, so the strategy of insurgency is that basically you get as many people as you can with as many guns as you can and you take on the state opponent. And you don't always take it on directly by going to the battlefield or something. Sometimes you do sabotage, you do assassinations, you try to build a, a network of sympathizers and supporters, but you're fighting the regime and you, your object is to take them down from the center. And to really, over time, corrode their capacity to maintain power. This is a very difficult way to win in most states, which boasts the, the monopoly on the use of force. The strategy of nonviolent resistance is not to actually confront that state at the top, the, the, the regime elites at the top. It's instead to try to leverage people power to pull the pillars that support that regime elite at the top away from it. In other words, every regime has people it needs to rely on to maintain power, whether they're economic elites, business elites, security forces, police civilian bureaucrats, state media. It needs their active obedience and cooperation to maintain the ordinary running of things. And the power of civil resistance inheres from its ability to start disrupting the ability and willingness of those pillars of support to maintain obedience. So let me get more into uh, why. Uh, so this actually is just showing that participation matters. <laughs> participation matters a lot. Uh, this is actually a very difficult uh, chart to interpret because the bottom axis is a logarithmic value. But the way we can interpret this is basically saying, if you're between this, this bottom uh, third here, your, your probability of success is between 10 and about 30%. Um, which is where most violent insurgencies fall, in that range. And that's just a few thousand members. Um, and it's, it's maybe like uh, less than 1% of the population most of the time. So then if you get up to a percent of the population where you're somewhere between 25 and 5%, your campaign is much more in the 50-50 range. 25 to 5%, you have pretty good odds, actually, of, of winning. You're, you're, it's half and half. The regime's going to win or you're going to win, but, but you, you have a fighting chance. Once you get up above the 5%, uh, uh, of the population mobilized in a civil resistance campaign, it becomes very, very difficult for regimes to hold on uh, because their pillars of support start to crack apart. And in fact, if you're up in the range of about 7.5 to 10 percent of your population, uh, most regimes cannot survive this level of challenge. They simply, the, the, the pillars of support don't stay there uh, for them to, to continue holding on. So 
this argument is really premised on the notion that, non, that people will be more willing to participate in nonviolent campaigns. And so the question is, why would that be? Well, Maria and I thought a lot about this. And we came up with this theory that basically um, there are higher barriers to participation in a violent insurgency. And, and we, we, call it, we, we sort of break them apart into four different types of barriers, physical barriers, commitment barriers, informational barriers, and cognitive barriers. So let me first get to the physical ones. So um, does everybody know what ROTC is? ROTC, yeah, everybody knows ROTC. Is there ROTC at Dartmouth? Yeah? So I was in ROTC in college. Um, and, uh, and I can tell you, this is, this is a structured military thing. Um, so, you know, we, we're supposed to get up every morning at like 4 o'clock and um, go to physical training and stuff. And I can tell you that uh, in preparation for any type of armed conflict, whether it's organized or disorganized or whatever, you know, nobody likes getting up. I didn't like getting up at 4 in the morning and running until I vomited. You know, that's just me. But, but actually, um, so I quit <laughs> and did something else. It's really, you know, most people don't like the physical challenges of, of armed conflict. Um, and it's actually really difficult to get, though some people like it. Some, 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 for some people, they like the discipline, they like the routine, they like the, the exercise, whatever. But most elderly folks, women, and kids aren't going to do that as, as something they want to do on a daily basis. They're certainly not going to engage it in any disciplined way. They don't want to camp in a cave or in the jungle for an undisclosed number of months. Um, it is hard living. It is hard living to be as in part of an underground organization, um, whether you're in an advanced democracy or you're in, um, in, in, a, in a very undeveloped place. And so uh, there are physical challenges to participation. There are even physical challenges to, to participating in just the training exercises themselves. I mean, so many people engaged in armed groups die when they're just handling weapons by accident. Um, the second type of barrier to participation is a commitment barrier. And this one relates to the fact that most rebel groups have a high barrier to entry in terms of your level of commitment. If you're going to join the group, you're going to demonstrate your commitment to the group because the risks are so high for the group to disclose their being that you know, a lot of times in many countries, people are forced to kill somebody as a demonstration of the fact that they're not informants. So there's not really, it, to, to establish the level of trust necessary to sustain an armed organization, um, people are often required to do things that ordinary fo folks are going to think really long and hard before doing. And, uh, and so with a nonviolent campaign, People can participate when they feel like it, you know, when it counts. But then they can go home back to their day job or their family. They don't have to leave. They don't have to go underground. Um, there are, you know, you can participate in an ad hoc manner. It's not going to actually disrupt your daily life that much until sort of the chips are down and it's time to show up for two weeks. But otherwise, you know, things, things go on as ordinary. There are also lower informational barriers. Now, a lot of armed groups have a major communication problem. I talked about Max Abrams saying that terrorism has a communication problem as a tactic. But in general, any type of armed activity does. Because when you're underground, that means you're not available to be out in the public as a publicity person, explaining to everybody why you're doing what you're doing, how many you are, and what the viability of your campaign is. So the way that many armed groups demonstrate their credibility and their commitment is just by doing armed acts. But it's very difficult to infer from armed acts how many there actually are in support of it. So there's, a, there's an information problem. With civil resistance, on the other hand, let's say you live in, in, in a very oppressive regime, and you're in your apartment at 7 o'clock, and you hear a knock at the door. It's your next door neighbor. You open the door, and they say, we're having a demonstration tonight at 8.30. We anticipate that the police are going to be there. Here's a little flyer that gives you an escape route. We understand if you're not there. Now, if somebody came and talked to me like that, I wouldn't be going at 825 to show up and, and be the first person in the public square. You know, I would look out my window and see, are there power in numbers or not? And, I, and, and if they're not power in numbers, I'm going to stay at home. And, and I, I'm going to live to see another day, right? Um, but on that day when I look out and I see there are 6,000 people and there are people marching down the street, I feel safer. So I'll go ahead and go out and join into that. That solves my information problem. Civil resistance actions tend to be highly visible. They communicate 
in and of themselves what the power of numbers look like. Finally, there are cognitive barriers to uh, participation in armed conflict. And this is just based on uh, some research that I've been looking at lately on what it actually takes to convince people to use violence in a deliberate fashion against noncombatants and, and others, even, even uh, assassinations and things like that. And um, Dave Grossman wrote this great book that's called On Killing. And this book uh, evaluates all these different psychological studies that uh, militaries have had to do to try to ensure that their, their troops will actually discharge their weapons in the direction of the enemy during combat. Because there were so many uh, alarming studies that were coming back from combat effectiveness work showing that troops don't like shooting at the other side. They would rather shoot into the air and so forth. And so a lot of militaries undergo intense psychological training to try to remove the hesitation for killing. And in Dave Grossman's book, he says in these studies, they were trying to do psychological profiles of, of troops to find out who kills easiest. And they find that something like just a, a, a handful of percent of people do almost all the killing in combat. Half of them are like national heroes, you know, like people who are just true to the cause and they believe in it. And the other half of them are psychopaths, people who want to kill people. Now, that's, that's just the, the research. And so a lot of what goes into these the army studies uh, these days is trying to understand how you can make ordinary folks do what national heroes do naturally without having to make them psychopaths, right? Um, so guess what? If you have a civil resistance campaign, none of that is going to enter into the picture. You know, you don't have to try to deal with uh, desensitizing people to doing horrible things to other human beings um, or killing them. And, and then making them live with that later. OK. So I mentioned the sort of pillars of support argument, where nonviolent resistance seems to be a very effective way of breaking apart these pillars of support. And if that is true, then there really needs to be empirical evidence for the fact that civil resistance campaigns are outperforming violent ones and producing these breakings within the pillars. So again, I studied one of the most difficult parts, one of the most difficult pillars to actually change loyalties within, which is the security forces. So uh, what I looked at here is whether the security forces defected uh, to the campaign or not. And so what you can see is that participation definitely matters. This, this lower axis here, again, is the proportion of the population that's mobilized actively in the campaign. But what you can see is that violent campaigns, on average, um, kind of circle around the average size nonviolent not, uh, violent campaign doesn't really get more than a 20% chance of producing security force defections. And this is pretty natural. If, if you have an armed insurrection and people are shooting at you, usually most security forces don't think about it and think whether they want to join that side or, or stay with their side. Usually their training kicks in and they fire back, right? Um, that's typically the case. Not always, but typically. Whereas for nonviolent campaigns, you can see that as the number of people increases, it also is associated with an increase, like a, a major increase in the probability of the security forces defect. Because not only are people putting pressure on the security forces to change sides, but they're demonstrating their credibility and, they're, and, and that they're going to win eventually. And so you want to be on the winning side. So how does this work in the micro sense? Um, how many are married or in a, a, a serious relationship? That's kind of, sorry, I, I didn't mean to embarrass anybody, but, but <laughs> me too. So basically, uh, so you know that, that when you go home at night, the quality of your relationship and your happiness at home matters as to your quality of life in the long term. Uh, you want to keep that person happy in general. So let's say that there's, you're, you're in a repressive country and you're a general, and you come back from a day of repressing a bunch of students in the streets that have been demonstrating for a long time. Now your wife, you're, you're both in the, in, the, in, the, in the country central party. Your wife is like one of the educational elites. Um, through the sort of crony system, she's been awarded the presidency of a, of a major university. It's a big state university. She's the president. And uh, you come home from one of these days of repression, and she's giving you the phrase. And you're sort of like, what is it? You know, would you just tell me what's going on? And she's like, you know what? I saw on the media what happened out there today, and I saw some of my kids in that crowd. You know, and, and so, okay, 
all right, I get it, I get it. So this is not going to make the general change sides. Right? The, the general's not going to then be found, and his wife's not going to be found usually the next day in that crowd demonstrating alongside the students. But day after day after day of this, and the general's wife giving him the freeze because he keeps doing the same thing over and over again, and she gets angrier and angrier, the general may one day just decide to keep things happy at home that he's going to call in sick. Calling in sick and calling in sick multiple times or having multiple officers call in sick can sometimes make or break these movements, right? This is non-cooperation. It's non-obedience within the pillars of support. And this sort of action, it turns out, can be very consequential. So notice that it's not appealing to their hearts. It's not trying to make them love the movement. It's not trying to win over their sympathies or their loyalties or anything like that. It's about raising the costs for them of perpetrating the same thing every day forever, right? Okay. So it is true that, um, that many nonviolent campaigns suffer massive amounts of repression. We're seeing it all over the world all the time. And one of the, 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 the big re, re, uh, hesitancies that I've always had about uh, the effectiveness of nonviolent resistance is that I thought they can't be effective if the regime decides it wants to repress in a major way. It just can't, can't, can't work. So remember when I described the data set I mentioned that there were three maximal goals I looked at, regime change, anti-occupation, and secession. All three of these are kind of major goals. And so in almost all of the cases, 90% of the cases, all of the campaigns face massive repression from the state because they were asking the state to reorder itself. <coughs> Even so, having experienced that level of repression, the nonviolent campaigns outperform the violent ones by over two to one. So why is that? I think there are two reasons. The first is the phenomenon of backfire, which people like Brian Martin and Lee Smithy and, and Gene Sharp calls it political jujitsu. Um, others call it the boomerang effect. In other words, it's observed a lot of times all over the place. If we have that many synonyms for the same thing, <laughs> that means that it's happened a lot, right? And so um, we see it actually happening more when a campaign stays nonviolent in the face of mass repression. Why is that? Well, one of the major uh, kind of necessities uh, for a campaign to experience or elicit backfire is that there has to be a sense of moral outrage at the repression. And I don't have a global study of public opinion polls or anything like that to refer to, but the cases with which I'm familiar suggest to me that people tend to be more outraged when nonviolent protesters or demonstrators or boycotters or strikers are repressed than when armed groups are repressed in general. Now, people don't like it when armed groups are repressed and it affects a bunch of innocent civilians, which happens a lot. But that's kind of a difficult gamble for armed groups to make, is just to rely on civilian casualties to help boost your popularity, right? Another reason why nonviolent resistance might be outperforming violent resistance in this regard is because when you have mass numbers of people participating in a campaign, you have a much wider variety of tactics available to you. Instead of just attack or retreat, you have, when you retreat, you have a method that you can rely on to continue applying pressure and disruption in the retreat. So, in nonviolent resistance literature, there are two types of methods. One are methods of concentration. That's like demonstrations, protests, things where people come together in, in a particular space and try to disrupt the system. These are very high risk, very vulnerable to repression, and over time become extremely predictable, not very useful. But then if you have a movement that will alternate or sequence tactics, to methods of dispersion or non-cooperation. This is when people withdraw their obedience through strikes, boycotts, um, economic or social non-cooperation. Then these are really hard to repress. So this is a, a picture of a general strike up in Kashmir. Um, and you can see the security forces are a little bit confounded for where they find the people they're supposed to repress. <laughs> um, and so a case of this is the Iranian Revolution. The, 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 the one from 78 to 79. Most people don't associate it with being a nonviolent revolution, but it was. 
And uh, what happened there is that there were, it was called the Hundred Years Revolution, uh, I'm sorry, the Hundred Days Revolution. And for about the first 90 or so days, the tactic was, let's have a protest. We go out and protest, and then somebody gets killed. So then we have a funeral procession, which is essentially another protest. And we do that. We gather more people. It's really great. Then they repress our funeral procession. And then we keep going to the same place at the same time every day, and we get repressed, and we're getting hammered. Thousands of people are killed because the, the tactic just repeats itself over and over again. But once the revolution was able to get the oil workers on board, the oil workers went on strike. And they stayed home. They did a, a stay at home strike. The security forces were ordered to go house to house and pull the oil workers out of their homes and march them back to work, which they did. And the oil workers got to the oil fields and they worked at half pace. And then they went home and didn't show up to work the next day. So the security forces are ordered again to go house to house, pull all these people out onto the streets and march them back to work. They get to the oil fields, they work at half pace. Day three, the same story. Security forces are starting to realize their paycheck's not going to come next month. And so what do they do? They give up the ghost. And they just decide they're not going to, we're not going to do this type of repression anymore. I'm not going in my neighbor's house anymore like this and, and doing this thing. I'm not joining the revolution. We're just going to step aside. You know, and the Shah has to leave. So one thing I sometimes hear, and that's very popular among, um, I'll say critics of this research, is uh, the notion that nonviolent resistance can only work when it has significant international support. So uh, we studied whether there, it really matters for nonviolent or violent campaigns to get material aid from foreign states. And uh, we found that in terms of overt military aid or uh, for armed camp conflicts, we do see about 35% of them getting military support in some sense, guns or weapons or, or uh, money. But less than 10% of nonviolent campaigns get any type of material support. In this case, it's, it's money. And uh, this is just a little cartoon of the Egyptian military accusing an April 6th person of uh, being sponsored by Americans. <laughs> um, so basically, um, the punchline here is that nonviolent campaigns almost never get uh, international aid. I think it's because they don't hardly ever get noticed until they've actually won. Um, and so everybody's sort of late to the party. But here's the interesting thing. Of those 10% of, those of the cases where they actually do get support, there isn't a lot of evidence to suggest that it helped them very much. And the reason goes back again to the dynamics of civil resistance, which are based on participation. So let's say that you are participating in a nonviolent campaign. You've been doing it for six months. You've been risking your neck. It's getting really hairy out there. And then somebody calls you and says, I just found out that our movement leadership is accepting money from the US, like the CIA. So as, an, as somebody who's participating in this movement, you're going to think one of two things. One, I'm not going to risk my neck anymore if they're getting rich. Or two, I hate the United States. I'm not going to participate. I, think, I guess you could think of three things, too. You could think, oh, awesome. I want to I do this because the US is supporting it. Unlikely, but possible. <laughs> And so, uh, but, but basically, there are, there are two bad outcomes from the perspective of someone who wants to help these campaigns, and only one good one. So uh, basically, what we, what we typically see is that um, getting that kind of direct material aid, overt material aid, can undermine the participation advantage that the nonviolent campaigns have. For armed campaigns, it actually helps them. It's like the one thing that helps armed campaigns win. And it's because, again, they're based on their resource access. What they need is more guns and more money to maintain themselves. They can't post the numbers. They need to make up for it with better RPGs, better intelligence, and stuff like that. So it, has a, it, has an, it, it increases their chances of success by about 15%. Now, that's not to say that the international community should just not do anything and that uh, we should just let these movements decide themselves when they're facing brutal repression. There's human rights abuses and stuff like that. But um, if you want to think about you know, what might be the most effective types of interventions, uh, there might be some creative ones at our disposal. One is helping groups to get access to NGOs whose function is specialized in uh, helping people learn how to do better nonviolent conflict, helping people to protect themselves from repression 
uh, and to get their human rights respected in certain conflicts and this sort of thing. And some of the follow-up research I'm doing shows that there's a modest positive association between groups in, in the post-Cold War period having access to international NGOs who specialize in human rights or nonviolence and their probability of success. In other words, knowledge is power. Knowing how to do better nonviolent resistance might be helping these movements. Okay, so wrapping it up, there's always this question of, uh, we know that, non, that, that violent insurgency works sometimes. Absolutely it does. Uh, we've, we've got cases like you know, the, the Cuban Revolution, uh, the Algerian Civil War, the Chinese Revolution, the Russian Revolution. All of these are good examples of where violent conflict was successful. The question is, in the long term, what are the costs associated with the method and what kind of societies emerge from places where violent insurgency has succeeded? Now, this isn't anything systematic. These are just um, random uh, numbers that I've thought about lately. But if you look at um, the deaths associated with civil resistance campaigns, mixed campaigns, and violent campaigns, you'll see that in Tunisia, Bahrain, and Egypt, all of three I'd call pretty much, up, uh, uh, through their conclusion, more or less pretty disciplined nonviolent campaigns. You see in Tunisia there were uh, 221 dead. In Bahrain there were there have been 54 so far. And then in Egypt there were 875 killed um, in civil resistance. So there was repression, fatal repression. Um, but compare it to Syria 2011, uh, which in July developed an armed wing and then started to see massive uh, civilian fatalities, up to 5,500 now. Yemen, um, I haven't updated this, but uh, the last I looked, they were up to 1,900 deaths. And then if you take a look at Libya, which was a, an armed conflict, there was, there was no civil resistance in Libya. There were two days of spontaneous protests and then armed conflict and then NATO intervention. Uh, the figures are anywhere between 20,000 and 50,000 casualties. And then in Syria in 1982, um, this is uh, up to between 20,000 and 40,000 casualties in a three-week period when Hama was under siege because they had an armed Islamist insurgency uh, taking on Hafez al-Assad, uh, Bashar's father, um, and trying to, to, to establish a, a different regime. This was in three weeks of shelling, displacing 200,000 Syrians and literally removing the town of Hama from the map at the time. So, Relative to the number of people who die um, in armed conflicts, the number of people who die in civil resistance campaigns is horrific and inexcusable because they're peaceful protesters. And it is so much less than what it could look like if the si both sides were using arms. The second question is, you know, what kind of political systems emerge um, behind uh, nonviolent campaigns relative to violent ones? This is looking at what the country, the, the bottom axis here is what the country was a year before the campaign starts. In other words, uh, what level of democracy the country is the year before it starts. So negative 10 is like a pretty much a, a monarchy, a total mo monarchy or a totalitarian regime, and a positive 10 is like an advanced democracy like the UK. So you can see that for violent campaigns on the left, um, you know, the, if, if it's a democracy at the beginning of the campaign, it's got a 50-50 chance of being a democracy at the end of it. Um, whereas for nonviolent campaigns, if it's a democracy at the beginning, all the way up at the right-hand side, it's almost guaranteed to be a democracy at the end. Um, if it's in this negative five to five range, an anocracy where it's, it's sort of like undergoing transition or is uh, you know vacuum of power or something like that, you can see that far more countries emerge democratic five years after the campaign is over in that range than those that are fighting an armed insurgency. In other words, uh, civil resistance tends to produce democracies. Violent resistance tends to produce more authoritarian regimes. This should make some sense. If you win by the sword, why would you give it up once you're in power? Win by the sword, rule by the sword. And another thing is that uh, if you're familiar with Robert Putnam's work on bowling alone, that's the sort of popular uh, version of his argument that he makes in making democracy work. Um, he's arguing that social capital or the association of people, people being together uh, and doing lots of robust like activities outside of work, like belonging to a church, belonging to a political organization, 
doing humanitarian activities, doing other things like that, that makes democracies better uh, because it increases civilian interest and responsiveness by politicians. Well, civil resistance, if you think about it, it's like social capital but on steroids. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's in many ways creating the norms and, and sort of reproducing these norms that, that Bob Putnam was talking about, um, but in a way where they're actually doing it before democracy or democratic institutions are even open for business in a way. So um, in terms of the outcomes on the likelihood of recurrence of, of civil war, um, I took a look at whether the country is likely to experience another civil war within the next 10 years after the end of a nonviolent versus a violent conflict. And what we see here is that um, nonviolent campaigns are 15% less likely to experience a relapse into civil war than armed conflicts. So the three points here are nonviolent campaigns are associated with fewer civilian casualties, more democratic systems, and more peaceful systems than armed campaigns. So there are a number of implications of this research. Um, for scholars, I think there are a few things. The, the first is that it, it re-emphasizes the notion of consent rather than, rather than force as a source of power. Um, consent and obedience are just as important as the ability to shoot a bunch of people. Because any dictator that actually wants to kill a bunch of people has to have agents helping him do that. And their obedience to, do, to, to, the, to the task is critical. And so um, that seems to be where this research is pointing as the, the source of real power. The second thing that it does is it refocuses our attention on the role that civilians can play in wars. So a lot of the civil war literature out there and, and stuff in security studies, it sees civilians as victims or resources. Victims, well, people we want to protect, you know, people that it isn't fair to kill during wartime, but we all do it anyway, that sort of thing. Or resources to be plundered. We can tax them, we can loot, we can quarter ourselves. Um, they're, they're interfering, they're, they're, they're caught in the crossfire, uh, but we work around it. This research actually makes civilians the agents of conflict. It's saying, never mind that they're victims or that they're resources, they are the agents of change. They can do, they're, they're not just helpless people caught in the crossfire. They can actually go out and make a change for themselves. And there's always this kind of enduring debate in political science about what's more important, structure or the institutions that sort of condition responses of individuals or agency. That is, the choices people make, regardless of structures. And I think that um, much of what I've been talking about here emphasizes agency over structure. What, what this story is, is it's a story about people making choices that are overwhelming the structures of the society that have been burdening them for so many years. So I think that that's really refocusing us and, and challenging us as scholars to come up with better ways to understand that. For policymakers and for the public in general, I think that it, it draws our attention to, you know, who we support. Um, and <clears throat> in that sense, it was a typical practice of many countries up through the Cold War to get behind certain rebel organizations that they thought would help them to achieve wider aims. And I think at times there were very cynical reasons for doing this, and at other times the reasons for doing it were very sincere. You know, that there was a belief that this would help to promote democracy and better outcomes for people. But regardless of whether it was sincere or cynical, um, I think that it didn't really work to do that in many contexts, but here is an alternative. And so I don't know, as I said, that, that governments should be in the business of endorsing, supporting, or trying to foment civil resistance campaigns. But they can certainly provide moral support for such campaigns. They can certainly come out and say, you know, that people have the right to peacefully organize for legitimate grievances and to let people on the ground know that they are being heard and that there's a witness to what's happening. Um, and then finally, I want to re-emphasize the importance of civilian-led instruments rather than our typical policy tools. Um, you know, a lot of times when I talk with policymakers about this, they want to know, can we give them money, can we give them arms, or who can I pressure in the government to, to change this outcome? And uh, because this is mass-based, 
uh, unarmed resistance that ordinary folks are taking upon themselves, the ordinary policy, foreign policy toolkit is not as useful. But what may be useful are things that put civilians with know-how in touch with other civilians with know-how. And so there's a, there's a book called uh, The Diplomat's Handbook by a former ambassador named Mark Palmer that lays out uh, case studies of different pro-democracy and human rights movements around the world um, that have had uh, assistance um, from, from different members of the international community and even doing things like convening groups of people together who really should talk, you know, opposition groups from different countries and maybe they could help each other, um, but then standing back and just letting them do what they're going to do, but at least putting them in touch. So there are lots of different ways that are more creative that are based on accessing civilian power rather than the typical uh, instruments of um, regime elites. So I'm going to end there and uh, hopefully my voice won't give out before the end of Q&A, but if it does, that's just because your question was too smart and too hard for me to answer, I'm sure. So um, how about if we end there and I'll entertain your questions. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Um, I want to kind of, I mean, a lot of this stuff is very, very complicated, and sometimes aggregate statistics don't seem to me to get at the complexity of it uh, in, the, in the human and the psychological sense. But um, I want to go back to the civil rights movement in the United States, which may not even fit your criteria because it's not seeking, I mean, in a sense, it's seeking regi regime change in, in, in southern municipal and state governments and so on. But in any case, um, you talked about sort of the level of commitment that it took to engage in violent protest and violent opposition versus the level of commitment it took to engage in nonviolent or uh, civil uh, peaceful protest. And it seems to me that <laughs> if you look at the reality in the South in the 1950s and early 60s in particular, and if you look at um, especially the rural areas of the South, in places like Mississippi and rural Georgia and rural Alabama, for example, um, people who engaged in nonviolent protests were putting their lives on the line. You know, not only were they in danger of losing their lives, and it's true that relatively few people were killed, but still large numbers of people were brutalized, large numbers of people lost their jobs, large numbers of people were driven out of their communities and so on. And so I, I find your distinction, uh, I, I understand, you know, I, I, in fact, one of the, one of the points that the critics of nonviolence made was that it was asking people to make too great a commitment to allow themselves to be brutalized in the course of seeking to bring about change within the system or in the system. So I, I don't know if you want to expand on that, but with regard to the civil rights movement in the United States, I found your distinction there quite problematic. Yeah. So your first point about aggregate statistics and complexity, I mean, you're absolutely right. And this is a first cut at the data. I hope what it does is generates interest in the topic enough that people will devote time and resources to getting at those complexities even better. And I myself am one of those, but can't do it completely alone. Um, on your point about the US civil rights movement, first, it, it's not in the data set uh, because it was viewed as civil rights. Um, but uh, the fact, so let me, let me just modify a little bit what I said about commitment levels. I agree with you. And, and I think that in general, the cases that I've talked about here, people's participation openly in these nonviolent campaigns is putting them at lethal risk. Absolutely. And I think you're right that that was the case in, in many places in the US civil rights movement. And I don't think that violent resistance can outperform nonviolent resistance in that regard. Right? So they were at equal or greater risk from participating in armed insurgency in the same context. So the, the key is that there may be wide variation, but no matter what, as soon as one makes that leap and joins the armed mo movement, there are going to be now significant barriers to returning to normal life after the conflict is over, if it ever ends. Whereas for nonviolent campaigns, you are talking about a commitment uh, usually that, like um, uh, um, enormous amounts of training and sustaining all kinds of social ostracism and everything else. And when you're finished, you return to normal life. And for many people, they participate in a way 
that is relatively casual, and that's welcome with civil resistance. So, so you're right, um, and I didn't mean to diminish that, but, uh, but I still think that there's no advantage in terms of commitment for armed conflict. I was rather surprised at the beginning that you talked about how you had never considered the argument that nonviolence was more effective than violence. Yeah. Um, because that's the argument that Gandhi made, it's the argument that Martin Luther King made, it's the, it's the arguments that Gene Sharp has been making for decades. Do you think you were unique in that, or is there sort of a, a, a lack of communication between the sides uh, to the extent that they don't even know what the other side is claiming for why it should be effective, or uh, are the, the, the reasons for support? of the other side, because I certainly, all, all the times I saw it, it was never, this is the moral thing to do, though it, there's some of that, but this is the effective thing to do. Yeah, so I think that in, in my field, I'm not unique. So I think there's a huge gap between what security studies scholars do and what uh, people do in, in other fields that identify as like peace studies, peace, peace science even, and stuff like that. It, there's like a huge gulf. I don't know why that's the case. Um, I think that some of it has to do with, um, with connotations of words. So I prefer the term civil resistance literally to avoid running into the perception by others that I am getting behind this argument because I have a dog in this fight morally and want to push an agenda, right? And, and so that's another reason why I come out at the beginning and say that. Because I want it to be clear that, I'm, that I started out a skeptic with like a neutral position on whether I would find the answer I got or not. Because I think that like some people end up, there's a well-known study um, by Freedom House about how civil, civic uh, engagement and civ civil resistance actually improves uh, transitions from authoritarianism and, and uh, democracy. It was published by a group called Freedom House. It's a very, uh, relatively conservative pro-democracy uh, research body. And um, some of the people who work there also work at this International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. And so that study was totally panned in, in a lot of circles because they said they have an agenda. You know? So I think it's really important to say this is, this is a research finding. And I actually, I am now convinced and I, my, hope, my great hope is that we start talking to each other, these, these two different groups, and it, 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 it no longer becomes a unique position to go through four years of graduate school, get a PhD, and ne never have heard of Gene Sharp before as a security studies person. I think that's tragic, and, and I hope to change it. Uh, so I had a question about your methodology. Yeah. Did you have enough data points to ever analyze like these conclusions on the basis of like what governments they were under or not? Because I just get the feeling that say like a Slovak nationalist would have a much easier job than a Chinese student. Yeah. Did you have enough data points for that? Yeah. So we were able to look at whether there's variation across regime types, and uh, and and also wealthy versus poor regimes, very powerful regimes versus um, uh, weaker regimes and this sort of thing. The, the thing that's so crazy is that it's, it's so, there's so much continuity across all different types of regimes. Again, and, and I think part of it is just because our data on regime type isn't quite as nuanced as it needs to be because we're always focused on it from a top-down perspective. So we're getting our data points from other elites who tell us what kind of regime it is and uh, not as much paying attention to what ordinary folks think they're doing, you know? Um, so we need better data. But another thing is just that, um, I mean, you're right that there is a distinction between whether you're making territorial claims or whether you're trying to oust a dictator. So um, interestingly, dictatorships are easier to overthrow than, than seceding, for instance, which is very difficult. Um, whether you're nonviolent or violent, it's just really hard to do. Um, but uh, China, you know, you bring up China, such an interesting case. I mean. Two years ago, there were 90,000 uh, local protests in China observed that we know of. Last year, there was just a report leaked that there are 200,000 protests in China last year, 2011. And um, 
the fishing village of Wukan had just ousted all of the local authorities and refused to let the national authorities in, blockaded the village. You know, it's a, it's a small village, 12,000 people, but 6,000 of them, half the population, were actively participating in this uh, thing. So, you know, it, um, I think that the thing with China is that the regime is so good at managing the information environment, so it's very difficult for all these local disparate groups to sort of get together. Um, and there is a type of discourse that's acceptable there, which is that it's okay to criticize the local government for poor performance, but it's not okay to criticize the central government. And if you do that, or you criticize the party, you're disappeared. So the, the key challenge for people in China that uh, if they wanted to uh, produce any type of change is really coordinating the different efforts because there's plenty of it there as plenty disruptive. Um, but it's very difficult for them to coordinate in the way that would make for meaningful change centrally. Um, I was wondering whether nonviolent resistance is less effective or violent resistance is more effective in um, social revolutions as opposed to political revolutions. Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Uh, I don't have an empirical answer for it. I don't see, um, so I guess it depends a little bit on what the social revolution is attempting to achieve. Um, but uh, I don't see any really good theoretical reasons for why the insights that I've just talked about here shouldn't apply to other types. So um, if you give me $400 million, I can collect the data and find out. As a student in the 70s, um, one of the most disturbing events that happened on the world scene for me was the 1973 coup d'etat in Chile, mm. where it seemed to me that uh, a country who went the right way about regime change was brutally repressed. Did your research, does it give you any insight on what was going on in that situation and how that vicious regime was able to stay in power? Yeah. So. So regimes can, can repress so much as to make no type of resistance effective. Uh, and I think that there are certain types of regimes that establish such authority and such obedience over their followers um, that it's very difficult to launch any type of sustained challenge from the bottom up. And you know the interesting thing is that it took a while, and there were lots of of opposition is killed in the meantime. Um, but you know, in Chile, they were eventually able to throw out Pinochet. And there was a civil resistance as part of that effort. Um, and uh, one of the things that's really uh, interesting about the, the Chilean situation is that they relied so much on low-risk methods of dispersion to signal how many people were behind that effort. Uh, so one of the, the, the tactics that had actually been popularized under Allende was banging pots and pans. And so people would go home every night and just bang on pots and pans. And the entire, you know, the, the major cities were just like reverberating with the sound. And uh, another really effective tactic was singing. People would write little songs uh, criticizing the regime. And the regime actually then outlawed public singing. But this was like a disastrous strategic misstep because it made the regime look completely ridiculous. So types of tactics that kind of put the regime in a position to where it has to do something ridiculous is good for the movement because then everybody knows how silly it is that the regime is a lie, that it's completely illegitimate, and it gets more people on board with, with this. So, you know, ultimately, you know, that over time, it took a long time, but, but there was a, a civil resistance campaign of these low risk actions that then put people in a position to be more confident to vote no in the referendum to extend his, his power, right? So, uh, other example, I mean, the, in the Iranian revolution, it was similar. There was a lot of singing inside houses at night. Um, in Tehran, you know, uh, very popular to do that. Uh, in Serbia, people would go home every single night. You know, you had 95-year-old ladies and you had, 
kids going home every night at 9 p.m. shutting off the lights for five minutes and then turning them back on and, and stuff like that. Just you know you're not alone. That's the key is to know to know that they're not alone so that when there's a, a, a sort of strategic opportunity or moment around which people can unite, they know that that people are going to show up. Um, I think I have two questions. I was fascinated by how few, how, wh what a small percentage it takes to turn the tide. And so I guess the question I, I have, you talked about the, the pillars not being able to withstand after a certain point. Is that because the movement intentionally attacks certain pillars or is it because it just happens that when it reach a reaches a critical mass, those pillars begin, begin to crumble? That's one question. And the second one, uh, the larger question really is, um, you know, our country has for so long been, is, is still really in the grip of what some have called the myth of redemptive violence, you know, it, and so that even though it's not, it's not a secret that nonviolence has been more effective, more, more people's lives have been changed nonviolently than violently, nevertheless we still cling to violence as, as a, 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 a way of resolving conflict. So for example, w with the build up to Iraq, you know, there, there was a nonviolent movement in Iraq that was pleading for support, that, 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 and, and we chose to ignore that and to do it our way. Uh, I suspect that has a lot to do with the military-industrial complex, but I guess my bigger question is, what will it take to get us to, re to change our ways, given that you, you've, you've even got empirical evidence that this works? What, what's, what's the barrier? Yeah, so the first question about how few people are necessary, um, 10% of the population is a huge revolution. I mean, the Iranian revolution had 10% of the population, and that was, up until then, I believe, the largest ever. Um, and it is just impossible to ignore 10% of the population out. <laughs> um, and, and so I think what it does is it shows an inevitability. And I think this is why Syria has had trouble, because they haven't been able to produce a sense of inevitability in Damascus almost everywhere else, but where it counts, they haven't. So um, in terms of your second question, what is it going to take? This is what I've been grappling with uh, since this book came out. Um, I can tell you that uh, when I was going around talking about why violence is effective, I got almost no pushback. When I go around and talk about why civil resistance is effective, I have gotten more pushback. I get more emails. I get an email almost every single day from some random person around the world who wants to argue about it. Yeah. Like it is, it is amazing, yeah. and and I don't know what that's about. Yeah. So, I would love to. Uh, I, my my research right now, I'm I'm sort of doing this side project, um, that's called the myth of the rational insurgent, mm -hmm. and it sort of breaks down six different myths that I think predominate about the utility of violence, about its necessity in many cases, about the things that it gives us that nonviolent resistance couldn't give us and stuff like that. And it tries to break it down empirically and show why they're myths. Um, and even with that, I get pushback. You know, I, I, um, and, and, and there are people for whom I think violence is serving very personal functions. And I don't, I don't know, you know I, that, that's why I call it the myth of the rational insurgent, because rational insurgents should be willing to immediately and without any reservation, substitute the method that works with the one that doesn't. And people are hanging on to violence for dear life. I don't know why. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I am interested in the diverging trends of uh, effectiveness of violent and nonviolent conflict, and I was wondering if you can offer any explanations of why uh, those trends are true, uh, at least with the data that you have. So uh, perhaps um, specifically, if you could comment on um, the role of media or uh, social media in this, do you think that maybe it's just that it's easier for people to communicate that uh, we will be at this place tomorrow uh, arguing for this, and uh, whether perhaps media such as you know the CNN effect helps uh, with this tactic of um, just uh, gathering support for the cause in um, showing showing uh, nonviolent protesters as uh, being the good guys and the repressive military as the bad guys. Yeah. So um, I too am interested in the diverging trends. And I've thought about it a little bit. Um, I think that the decline 
and effectiveness of violent insurgency can be somewhat related to the end of the Cold War because I think that during the Cold War, both the USSR and the US were kind of actively supporting armed groups around the world that was increasing their effectiveness. The funding sources have since dried up and so we see this huge decline in effectiveness. But that doesn't explain the rise of the effectiveness of nonviolent resistance. So I think there are a couple things going on. The first is that I think that there are what we would call demonstration effects, which is that people see it working somewhere and they think that regime looks like ours. We could do that here. So there's almost, Doug McAdam as a sociologist would call this cognitive liberation. Like the, the effectiveness of civil resistance in a case that looks like yours makes you suddenly think that this could happen for you too. And once that idea is in your head, there's really no going back. The second thing is the rise of NGOs devoted to the spread of civil resistance uh, effective civil resistance and minimizing risk to, to the persons and, and human rights NGOs. Um, Jim Lawson, who was a, a prominent member of the Nashville lunch counter protests and the civil rights movement in the US at large, once told me that um, when he was trying to develop strategy <clears throat> uh, and, and help mobilize people to participate in the Nashville lunch counter sit-ins, all he had was Gandhi's biography. And then he said to me, nowadays, you guys have Gene Sharp, you've got your stuff, you've got, all, you've got how to manuals, you've got the internet, all of this information is available. People are learning how to apply the technique more effectively. Another reason uh, why I think it might be improving is for technology, but not quite in the sense that you mentioned it. So um, I'm a skeptic that social media and the news can actually help nonviolent campaigns better coordinate. I think it's, it's actually better at helping regimes coordinate than activists. Coordinate repression, that is. But I do think there's something to having international media coverage in the sense that it makes people feel more emboldened to show up because they feel like somebody's watching. And the, this is not based on any type of empirical uh, evidence other than the fact that I've talked to lots of people around the world and they say that for them it matters for them to know that there's a witness. You know, that they're, they're not alone, people are watching. And if there's one thing we definitely have learned over the, the Arab Spring cases, it's that dictators are going to continue to do what they've always done. But for some reason, they don't want people watching anymore. The first thing they do is kick out the foreign journalists. Since when did they care, right? Something is shifting in sort of the global norms. And I think that having foreign journalists covering these things emboldens people to feel like they're not alone. I want to show one slide that I hope I have included here. Um, let's see. Demonstrating the hazard of, maybe I don't have it. No, I don't. Um, basically, it, it gets at the sort of hazard of over-relying on social media um, for a movement's success. And, and what it is, is it's a, it's a Facebook page that the Sudanese government developed. It's, a, it's a, just a killer Facebook page. It, it's got a, a picture of like an activist, like an anarchist activist. They're wearing, you know, it's like hoodie and like the whole thing. And they're, they have a Molotov cocktail and they're, they've got their other hand in a fist. And it says, protest such and such day and time, such and such square, you know, bring down um, Bashir, Omar Bashir, in Sudan. So uh, 17,000 people RSVP'd for this protest. The first few people showed up. The regime had made that site, set it up. They hired some graphic artist to make it look really legit. The first few activists show up who are the organizers who think that they need to be there to, to get people in order. They're rounded up and tortured. And all they needed were their Facebook, Facebook passwords. They had their email addresses. They just need their passwords. And then they go through and they get everybody else right, that, that wanted to, to participate in this event. So I think actually regimes are better at manipulating social media than most activists are. It's very dangerous to over rely on it. So what we can do is, is think about this in terms of like a battlefield. If your first line of communication is cut down, you use your second line of communication. You've got backups all the way back to where you're just like whispering stuff in the streets. Um, in Poland, during the Solidarity Movement, um, they, had a, they actually developed their own alternative media. They had a printing press. They developed an underground newspaper. 
Well, this was very threatening uh, to the Polish Communist Party. They seized the printing press, took all the paper and all the ink. So they don't have it, and it becomes illegal to have a, a private printing press in Poland. So uh, what the, the solidarity organizers did was literally have their members save up onion skins and deliver them to a particular set of locations where they then used rolling pins to roll them out into paper format and then used coal and charcoal to write flyers and instructions to their members. So then the regime is forced to make a choice. Do we outlaw onions and people with smelly hands or do we let this slide? No legitimate regime can get away with outlawing onions, you know? And so it puts them in this position. It helps the movement. And so they were able to maintain their open line of communication. It takes a lot of effort. But this is pre-Twitter. You know, th these are the old days. And, and Solidarity won in the end. It took them nine years, but they ultimately won the day. Thank you so much for uh, the uh, talk and the question and answer. Sure. Thanks.